It seems the Cascadia Fault did rupture not very long ago. This completely changes the narrative. So guys, have a coffee and let's look into this because this is very, very interesting. The mysterious Fickle Hill earthquake in Northern California may have a very unexpected source. This just was just released today the mystery quake that rocked Northern California in 1954 probably came from the eerie, quiet Cascadia subduction zone. Wow, that's a game changer. That is very interesting. What does that mean for our chances? <laughs> My chances, because I'm sitting basically right there, of that big, scary magnitude 9 plus mega thrust earthquake and the incoming tsunami that comes with it just 8 to 15 minutes later, 100 feet or so. What does that mean? What's going on beneath Fickle Hill in Northern California? Maybe, guys, the answer to an earthquake mystery that has puzzled seismologists for decades. They couldn't explain where this earthquake in 1954 came from because it was so large. Magnitude 6.5. And not only the scientists, the origin of that earthquake has also rattled the residents around Humboldt Bay, as you can imagine, because if you don't know what caused it, where it came from, you are very insecure. Can this happen again at any time? Can it get worse? What is it? It has been unclear for scientists and the residents. But now a new study suggests a surprising, very, very surprising source, the Cascadia subduction zone. The Cascadia subduction zone, guys, it runs from Northern California into Northern Canada along the coastline of Oregon, Washington, and then along Vancouver Island in British Columbia, Canada. And this subduction zone is very, very quiet. So in the bulletin of the Seismological Society of America, a team of researchers have shared the scientific sensation, we have to say, that led them to this conclusion that this was the Cascadia subduction zone. So they have looked, it's, it's, it's crazy. They have looked at basically fading paper records, modern methods and modern modeling, and also eyewitnesses accounts of this event because it just happened in 1954. In, on December 21st in 1954, to be precise. And it occurred in a region where earthquakes are common so it was not a complete surprise that there was an earthquake because this part of coastal California there in the north, it includes the Mendocino Triple Junction. It's such a beautiful area there. I, I love this area. And uh, there's the Pacific Plate, the Gorda Plate, and the North American Plate, and, and they meet there. And this is the most seismically active area in the lower 48 states. Would you have guessed that? I know many people think we're out of Southern California, we're out of the LA area, we're out of San Francisco, we're going to Northern California, there we should be okay, right? We're, we're not threatened by the San Andreas Fault. Well, guys, I have to disappoint you. So despite the fact that there is this triple junction, the earthquake that occurred in 1954 was at a very unusual location. Plus the magnitude and the way it was shaking and the intensity of the shaking was not something that you would associate with that triple junction. It was a mystery. It's like, why is it where, there at this location and why did it behave like it did? because most earthquakes in the area are located within this Gorda plate, either offshore or in the portion of that that is subducted beneath the North American plate. And these are surface faults. There have been no large earthquakes on surface faults in the North American plate. In this region, in instrumental times, 
on record. Of course, the faults have been mapped as active, but that active didn't make sense to scientists. So Peggy Helwig is her name. She's a retired seismologist at the University of California in Berkeley's seismological laboratory. And she and her colleagues, they conclude that the 1954 earthquake was a thrust event. It was located about 11 kilometers deep below Fickle Hill to the east of the city of Arcata or Arcata, however you want to pronounce it. So all these characteristics taken together suggest that the most likely source of this earthquake is the Cascadia subduction zone. So what does that mean? So the Cascadia Fault hasn't been as quiet as everybody thinks. Is this a good thing for us that it is releasing stress? Or is this bad? Let's look into this. It's getting more interesting. We all know everyone who lives on the West Coast, the Cascadia subduction zone along the Pacific Northwest looms large in public minds, but also in scientific minds. I mean, we always hear the news, oh my God, it will rip open the Pacific Northwest. It will destroy the Pacific Northwest. Everything west of I-5 is doomed. The land will sink two meters. We will have that massive tsunami. So this subduction zone, this fault line has the potential to generate massive earthquakes, mega quakes. And there was one, a magnitude 9.0 in the 1900s has drowned in the 1700s, has drowned forests. We still these, see these, the evidence today it has sunk coastlines by six feet. It has led to a massive tsunami that has caused damage as far as Japan. And the tsunami that arrived in Japan was still very very high up to 15 feet that's like five meters this tells you how massive this earthquake was we just recently had one just just two weeks ago in kamchatka that earthquake produced a tsunami that has reached crescent city especially in california but didn't produce that high of tsunami waves so it tells you the Cascadia subduction zone earthquake is a monster, a sleeping monster. So that Fickle Hill earthquake, that magnitude 6.5 could actually help answer the questions that seismologists have been working so diligently for decades to solve. Does the Cascadia subduction zone only rupture in large events like in the 1700s style earthquakes? Does the entire subduction zone always rupture in one piece or can smaller parts of it rupture on their own? They have the theory that the subduction zone is divided in three zones. The southern zone in Northern California, then the middle zone that's basically Oregon, and then the northern zone that's Northern Washington and Canada. And there have been a lot of reports that they think that the northern zone in Canada will rupture most likely, which is not so good. But this new study may, might change the narrative completely. And there's only one other large recorded earthquake in the same area, or in the near area, the 1992 magnitude 7.2 Cape Mendocino earthquake. And now the scientists say that might have been the Cascadia subduction zone as well. So wow, that would really change everything. Because now we say, yeah, you know, along the Pacific Ring of Fire, this is basically a subduction zone. We have big earthquakes in Japan. We've just had a mega thrust earthquake in Kamchatka. But everyone says, well, the only thing that doesn't produce them on a somewhat regular basis is the Cascadia subduction zone. That's why everyone is so afraid of it, that it's so locked and loaded, while all the other ones do produce big ones from time to time in Japan, in other areas. So, but maybe, the subduction zone here, the Cascadia subduction zone, has also produced earthquakes. 
So the 7.2 Cape Mendocino, if that was the subduction zone, of course, not the whole subduction zone has ruptured. And the scientists are saying, well, if we have the 6.5, if we have the 7.2, and then we have the big, big, big one from the 1700s when the entire fault did rupture. And we just learned in the video that I just have released a few hours before about the comparison of the 7.7 .7 Myanmar Segang fault with the San Andreas fault. And there the scientists say the fault do not always produce the next earthquake in the same manner. They don't always react the same because that Myanmar earthquake hit at a completely unexpected location. They also thought, oh yeah, it's divided in zones. This is more likely to rupture than this one, like they do with the San Andreas Fault, where they say at the Salton Sea, at the southern tip, it's locked and loaded. That's the most likely location for a big earthquake. Myanmar, the gang fault, similar length, straight as the San Andreas Fault, has surprised everyone with the magnitude, with the location, and with the length of the rupture. And that means something for California. You should watch that video, guys. It's mega interesting. I promise, watch it. But let's get back to here. So Cascadia Fault also, we could, we could transfer that. Doesn't have to rupture in the same way each time. So 1700s, whole fault was rupturing. Then the scientists say, but we really don't know of any other earthquakes that we have measured with instruments that were on right on the subduction zone, on the Cascadia subduction zone. So then people have postulated that it's locked and loaded and nothing's going to happen until the next big mega thrust earthquake comes. And the scientists make it clear the Cascadia subduction zone is really unusual when it comes to like in the instrumental era since they are able to record these earthquakes it has been eerily quiet lori dengla she's also a retired seismologist from the humboldt university she says we don't really have smaller earthquakes and that's nothing you usually see in subduction zones so that's a strange part of it and then they are raising the question the mapped faults that they know of that are in the overlying North American plate that are related to that subduction zone, do they rupture on their own? Or do they only rupture as part of a mega thrust event? And now their conclusion, with the earthquakes that they found 1954 and 1992, they say, it looks like this is a little patch of the mega thrust that did rupture. So this is really new in terms of understanding how the Cascadia Fault works. Maybe it's not that overdue. Or maybe it's even worse because of that. So the scientists spent three years revisiting all the data from the 1954 event. They have analyzed public earthquakes catalogs, unpublished data from the Berkeley archives, and newly identified data from accelerometers that were operated at the time of the earthquake by the United States Coast and Geodetic Survey. And they really looked at like physical paper where they had that pen that was drawing the lines and they were scanning all the paper and they were digitalizing it and then analyzing it with AI algorithms. So they spent a lot of time localizing and digit digitizing records, creating a probability cloud for the earthquake's hypocenter. They have used modern software and they have determined a mechanism for the earthquake. And they said what was especially helpful for them is that they found records how the data were collected, including how the relevant stations at that time and the instruments operated and what calculations were made with these data throughout the years. 
So the importance of preserving those type of records is now really, really clear because now there's a better technology to draw conclusions from these data. And the scientists say, and that's quote, even when we think about our modern data collection and what we preserve, we need to think about it in terms of somebody in 50 years might want to go and have a look at that again. The metadata are really important, they say. And the researchers have also revisited the estimates of the earthquake's intensity. So with the help of reports that detailed the damaging that happened, people that felt the shaking and everything that basically had been gathered by the USGS, newspaper archives, photos, maps, damage to the water supply for the nearby town of Eureka and newly collected eyewitnesses accounts. They even have placed a call for earthquake stories in local newspapers telling people, hey, if you were there, if you felt it, if you experienced it, please contact us. They have posted in Facebook groups. And a lot of stories came in from people who were children when the earthquake happened 71 years ago, right? But they had remarkably consistent memories of sloshing bathtubs, toppling chimneys, like rolling ground that allowed the scientists to estimate the earthquake's intensity. And this is especially interesting. There's a story of one 11 year old girl that, that was riding her bicycle with a friend when they all of a sudden felt the shaking. The two of them then immediately, they said, dropped to the ground and they covered their heads. Seems they were well-trained in, in earthquake preparedness weren't they? No, they weren't. They said they were doing what they had been taught in their school's nuclear bomb drills. So these poor kids might have thought that there's a nuclear, nuclear bomb dropping. Well, it's 1954, right? And they also said they, they saw the rolling ground toppling chimneys and sparking power lines. But they said one of the images that struck in their head was at 1954, the unheard of sight when a woman was running out, woman was running out of her home with her hair still in curlers. It seems nobody did that at this time. Well, now you see this at Walmart a lot, right? So Fickle Hill, very, very interesting. I can't wait to hear more from the scientists, especially the conclusions that they will draw and the predicts predictions that they will make for a potential mega thrust monster earthquake at the Cascadia Fault. So I hope you liked it, guys. Please watch this video in the end screen about the new Myanmar study. And it also shows you for the first time in history how a slip event was recorded on camera. You see the land move. You stand here, your friend stands here, they move over 10 feet. Amazing. And the conclusion they draw, scary. Watch it. I see you there in a second. If you want to support the channel, fill me up with coffee, please. Link is in the description of the video, buymeacoffee.com slash silky. Thank you so much, guys. If you want to click the join button, you can become a supporting member of the channel for behind the scene videos. Thank you for your supers. Thanks for being here. Leave it a like, don't forget. I see you here. Click.